Good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Adoption Dialogue, the show about all things adoption, the joys, the challenges, and the many complexities. I'm one of your co-hosts, Judith Alexis Craig. I'm an adopted person, adoptive parent, therapist, and social worker. And I'm Sally Baffo. I'm an adoptive parent and adoption consultant, and I'm based in London. Judith is based in Canada. Okay. So, Auntie, can you please introduce our guest to us this afternoon? Yeah. Today we have Linda. Linda is a barrister in London, and she's been practicing law in various areas, but one of the focuses of her practice is also adoption. And I had a conversation with her recently, and she talked about an inter-country adoption and talked about an aspect of the law that I'd never heard about. And so she's here. She's going to tell us a little bit more about herself and the work that she got into what she's doing and more about what she does. So Linda, can you share a bit about yourself, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much to both the ladies for your introduction so that I know more about you, which is always very interesting. And also for introducing me and inviting me onto your program. My name, for some of you who have heard, is Linda, but my surname is Apia. I am a practicing barrister. I have been a barrister for a few years. I was cap it at 20. All right. A lot, long, long, <laughs> long time. And I, for as long as I can remember, I think from teenage years, wanted to be a barrister. And if people ask me why, I'd always say, because I like arguing. And I thought, where can I do that and earn money? And that's how I got into this profession. As has been said, I practiced in London, used to practice outside London in the Surrey area, oh. where I sort of honed my skills, then moved to London-based practice. I'm now head of chambers at the chambers in central London called Vine Court Chambers. We've been around now for 10 years. So again, that's a long time for us to be established. My chambers predominantly deals with immigration law, family and crime. So I started off with crime and immigration and family, so doing a bit of everything. Unfortunately, I think I came away from family because I found it was quite heavy going in mm -hmm. some areas, especially in matters to do with children, sensitive issues to do with children. Yeah. And people not, in my own opinion, of course, not quite understand that child's interests are best, regardless of your ego. Then crime, because I think it became a bit compromising, a bit difficult. And frankly, I found a lot of the clients were not as grateful. I thought they should be in light of the circumstances they were in. And then found my way moving more towards immigration. Now, I've been asked about the adoption work that I do, and that is interlinked between family and immigration. So you find that there is a lap over between them. And as the rules have changed and as things have got more difficult, you meet more challenging work, more challenging clients, and more challenging ways in which you have to help them reach their goals. And really, that's the basis of why I found myself moving more towards the adoption um, area. I know, of course, Sally um, is very much involved in the adoption, if I can call it, industry. And also I know one or two lawyers, certainly in Ghana, who are very much into the adoption sphere. So that's how I think I came into this sector and why I find it actually, despite it sort of overlapping with family, so interesting in terms of trying to assist people understand better what I think actually is a very difficult area to get through and very difficult to understand when you're dealing with two, three, four different countries' laws and having to amalgamate and put them together to reach the right end goal for you and your family. I suppose also when you have situations where, like here, for instance, we have something called a special guardianship and it doesn't mean that other countries have special guardianship. So then it means that one has to find an equivalent in order for you to make it legal in there. Whatever it is that is legal here has its equivalent in legality in that country as well. And I'm sure that's a real challenge. But one of the points that we talked about was inter-country adoption. First of all, Linda, explain to us exactly what constitutes inter-country adoption. Sure. Looking at my own definition. So looking at it in terms of what, what, what it actually means and what it does, it is obviously usually adoptions are for those under the age of 18 so for minors whether they be babies infants children teenagers and there is a desire to adopt those children so take over as the parents effectively of those children in another jurisdiction in another country so a typical example would be someone from Ghana who is a child and there are parents in the UK Canada USA other countries could be other African countries 
who wish to adopt that child to take them as their own child through the adoption process and then have parental responsibility and care needs for that child. So it is a legal process that one has to go through in order to ensure that adoption is recognised not only in, I give the example of UK, not only in the UK, not only in Ghana, but internationally throughout the world, that adoption is recognised as a valid process by which that child has been taken into a family and treated and cared for as a child of that family. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Which countries are you currently finding that you're working with the most in, in terms of between the UK and specific countries? Yeah. At the moment, the work that I'm doing is with the UK, because that's where I'm based, and Ghana. So that's the main countries that I'm dealing with. My family background is that we're from Ghana. And so it became easy to use that country, if you like, as the, the building block for trying to establish and work out how best these inter-country adoptions actually work and how we can make them better legally of course from my point of view but of course from other points of view such as yourself Judy that it's the emotional it's the therapeutic side of it but certainly from my side it's how to make the law more accessible and cohesive and clear to adopters and adoptees as they go through that process. You know Linda I just want to use an example that we had a few years ago this is a South African family. The lady had a niece here whose mother had died, unfortunately. And she had to come over and adopt the child. Unfortunately, when her older sister came, they found the law, the legal structure so complicated, she couldn't navigate her way through it and gave it up. But she came. And I do remember that at some point, the law changed because I think she needed to have lived here in England for about 10 weeks with the child. Can you to go through that particular aspect of intercountry adoption and the rationale behind it and whether that whole idea has changed? Because I think it really mm. made it difficult for a lot of people because you're working, you know, and how many companies are going to give you 10 weeks leave to go off to another country to go and be, you know, get acquainted with a new child? Can you talk through that particular aspect of it? Tell us a little bit more about what leads to that so people can put that into context. Thanks. Mm. Perhaps I think I'll do with what leads to it first and yes, then yes, yes. explain Talk a little bit more about what I, what I know. When you look at it, I suppose from what one would call a common sense point of view, you're taking on a stranger or taking on a child that is unfamiliar to you and the child, vice versa, will also be have, have a parent or prospective parent who is unfamiliar to them. I think there is a need on a real human level for that relationship to flourish, to get used to each other's personality. Everyone sort of thinks, well, children have to just adapt to you and how you do your things, etc. But especially the older a child gets, I think the more they have their own views, they have their own independence, they have their own position or opinion. So I think that to me, the rationale is that there, there are still some countries, some places where they believe that it is of benefit for the child and the prospective parent to have that contact, that communication, that link with each other, to make sure that actually that you're both prepared for this. You could be well-meaning adult and say, I'm going to adopt a child. But actually, when you come, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the child, but you just find that you just can't do it. Honestly, it, yes, really, it, Linda, it does happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but oh, I, I, let, me, let me give an example. Because when I went to adopt my children as well, honestly, they couldn't stand me at all. They couldn't stand me and I couldn't stand them either. But the question they asked me, actually, so mommy, why did you stick with us? Why did you stay? I must tell you, one of the, the things that I realized in that point is human beings, when you find yourself in a situation where, as an adult, that you're not liked, you actually have the choice to walk away, and you do. But when you're in that situation, you have to weigh whether or not is that the right thing to do to just walk away from these children. And I looked at the circumstances where they came from and what they'd been through and I knew that sending them back would be the most wicked thing to do. Mm. So I'm good at caring for people. I thought, well, let's give that a go. And that's what worked. And that's why we're still together. So I tell people that even though you get to points where you might not get on with the child or the child might not like you, I think if we use the basic principles of humanity, of kindness, nurturing, and start with that, something might develop from it. But please go ahead. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting point, actually. And I'm glad that's why I started with that point rather than the, the sort of the law and all of this sort of I'm stuff. I'm glad you mentioned that. That is the reality of it. Yeah. No matter 
what law may favor or not favor you if you don't gel either you or the child may say look i'm not i'm not into this i'm sure there are many children many adults who come to a point where they think they're not doing this it's too much for me and for various reasons <clears throat> i think you also do hit on a point about people and work because of course if the expectation is that a child should stay with you in the child's locality so let's take for example the child is in the uk as you said i think yeah. And the auntie was coming from South Africa, which how many employers will give you the opportunity to take all of that time off because you're looking after a relative's child or adopting a relative child, whatever the position may be. So I think it definitely has its challenges. But there are situations where I think that luckily these days, a lot of that I, I don't find happens very much. But I mean, not between UK and Ghana. I do have an example of one father, prospective father, who went to Ghana to adopt and left his wife here in the UK because she was in a better job, et cetera, et cetera. And the child they were adopting was a boy. And he made a conscious decision, actually. It wasn't because the law expected, it made a conscious decision to stay in Ghana with the child for six months to nurture, to grow, etc. There are some parents in Ghana, I know, who do actually stay with the children for a period of time again to nurture, to grow. There is another example I have of a mother who went to stay with the child for 12 months in Ghana. That, yeah. that wasn't because the law per se said it, but I think it was almost suggesting to her that it would be better. It would be more wholesome. It would be, be more in your favour when it actually goes through the adoption process, rather yeah. than you being one of the people that comes and adopts a child and whips straight back out of the country again. Yeah. Um, Especially, yeah. I think, if you're not from that country, I think there is an advantage in doing that. To familiarise yourself with where the child comes from, what they know, how they behave, cultural difference. Simple example in Ghana is children eating with hands. I know one of my nephews, when he started nursery, used to eat with his hands because his mum, as far as she was concerned, or we eat with our hands from Ghana, so that's what we would do in the house. And the teachers approached her one day in the nursery rather awkwardly and sort of said, well, excuse me, I don't mean to be sounding sensitive, but he tends to eat with his hands. Is there something we should know? And she taught them that, well, that's how we eat at home. So, yes, if you've got an alternative that you want him to learn because of the other children, blah, 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 I don't have any objection to it, but we must learn a way to introduce him to that so it doesn't seem so strange to him. So there's mm. a lot of it to do with the therapeutic side of it that isn't to do with lawyers, the law, what government says and what anybody says, but because you know that that is perhaps the right way to deal with this adoption with this child. When it comes to the law, <clears throat> excuse me, in the UK, there's no law that says that you have to have the child with you for a particular amount of time before you become an adopter. So if, for example, using Ghana again, because that's what I know, if you're bringing a child from Ghana, there isn't a law that says, well, you must live with the child in Ghana before you can adopt them into the UK or bring them to the UK. There is one, one exception, and it's called a de facto adoption. This is an adoption that's not necessarily adoption on paper. So this adoption is where the child is part of your household. So if, for example, I were to go to Ghana, and unfortunately, one of my relatives passed and their child was in that country. And there was no formal adoption, but the child is treated as my child, as part of the family, an integral part, take the other kids. Everybody's living there together. And then we decide after a year, two years, 12 years, 12 months, sorry, is the minimum. But after a year, two years, you know what? I think we want to come back to the UK. I think we want to resettle. We can make an application under the de facto provisions under some of the rules in the UK to actually apply for that child to come with us back to the UK. So you're saying here that you would bring that child into the UK without necessarily even having adopted the child in Ghana or yes. plan to adopt the child here. Now yes. That's interesting. That's a new yes. one on me. Okay. Yes, that's called a de facto adoption. It's right. probably new on you because it's not very common. Most people don't know about it. Right. And it is exceptionally difficult because as you can imagine you don't have the paperwork you don't have all sorts of things that make it easy for a de facto adoption to occur so a lot of people would rather just adopt the child go through the rigmarole go through the process under the rules and bring the child in that way but that doesn't mean that there aren't other alternatives it's just that i think if it were me for example and somebody came to me with a de facto adoption i would want to 
persuade them perhaps to go down the, the formal adoption route, but leaving the de facto adoption as an option in the event there was some complication or difficulty with a formal adoption or the formal adoption process. So hold on, Linda, with a de facto adoption, is this a case where, for instance, if I lived here in England and back home there's a child within the family who's grown up in the family home and the parent died and there was nobody else to look after the child and it was deemed that I would be the next best person to look after the child, would the de facto adoption apply to me if I was to bring that child into this country? Or would I have had to have lived in Ghana with that child before that could occur? Yeah, you'd need to live in Ghana with that child before the adoption could occur. Okay. Um, which actually brings me on to another point, and this is something, again, I've come across recently. Adoptions that are not required or needed or necessary, where you don't even have the de facto adoption. So take out the de facto adoption, then take out adoption completely, whether de facto or not de facto. If mm -hmm. you have a child who is a member of the family who, for whatever reason, is now abandoned, doesn't have their, their nuclear family, their parents with them, there are rules whereby you can actually bring that child over to the UK where you can prove that you are a relative. So it's not a he say, she said, whatever. And I'll use myself as an example, hopefully, so it becomes clear. So I'm here in the UK and then I have a cousin who has a son. My cousin and her husband pass away, either together, it doesn't matter, but they're both dead. And I want to bring my cousin's child to the UK to live with my family. If I can prove that that child is my cousin's child, so show the relationship through birth certificates and other documents. If I can prove that that child has nobody else that can look after them within the family. So, of course, if they had an older sibling who's, for example, an adult, the authorities, I think, would look at that person as the next of kin and therefore the logical person to look after. So it's not a question of, of choice. <clears throat> it's a question of necessity. If he said this child has no other relative in the country whom they can rely upon to look after them, there is a process under immigration rules that allows you to bring that child without a formal adoption, without a de facto adoption, to the UK to settle with your family. And hold on, Linda. So when that happens, did you know about this, Judith? I didn't. And I was just going to compare it to Canada because That's here, true. unfortunately, not like that. And actually, we run into that as a challenge because there are often family members abroad, you know, who have family members who live abroad. The exact situation, like you said, deceased parents, they want to bring the child to Canada and they will get in contact and then they realize this is actually going to be an inter-country adoption. And of course, unfortunately, they are thousands of dollars for all mm. of the legal fees, etc. So it is a real barrier here. So it's really actually quite interesting to know that the UK has this caveat, which I think is extremely important to have because it really does keep families then apart right and i think it's so important that that's something it's good to know that this exists that this could be taken on by other countries and and it should be i would suggest it really should be it's humane it's a humane thing to do yeah Linda, but i need to ask you this so when the child comes into this country and that those whatever you call it, it's not de facto it's not adoption what then legalize their role within that family and their relationship with the the people who are they're living with because they're not really an adoptive family but they are so how, what, how is it seen in this country? How do they perceive that kind of situation legally? Well, we do have situations, don't we, where you don't have even people who are living here, breathe, living, breathing in the UK, Canada, wherever, who have <clears throat> other family members living with them who mm -hmm. aren't necessarily direct relatives or not their parents. So I could have a niece, a nephew living with me. As long as I put in with the family court the right documents to show that I have regard. So to appoint myself as a special guardian or as a guardian or a person with parental responsibility, then I can take on the role of the things that a parent would do. None of those stop me from cho helping to choose the child's school, taking the child to hospital appointments. Yes, it would need some explaining and needed to explain the dynamics of the relationship. But just explain the dynamics does not mean you're stopped from mm -hmm. taking on that parental ability. So it's about once the child comes here, I would think that you would want to register yourself through the family court 
as the person with parental responsibility, perhaps tell social services, for example, this child is here, if you want to involve social services, that is, but this child is here and they are part of our family now and explain what's happened. The biggest hurdle, in my opinion, is getting the child to the UK, getting the home office in the UK to accept that this child is genuinely related to me and genuinely has no one else who the child can live with in their country of origin or birth or residence. How long does that generally take? Because obviously if the child's parents have deceased and they're sort of living there maybe with a caregiver or a, an older relative who can't, you know, take on the care full time, how, how long does the home office usually take for those kinds of decisions? What's been your experience with that? Um, it used to be worse than it is now. It used to be, you're talking six months to a year. Yeah, exactly. Which is terribly mm. traumatic, especially mm. if you've lost your parents under quite bad circumstances. I'm not saying it's necessarily so much quicker, but there's one thing to bear in mind, I think, which is probably worse than the six months or so that I've just quoted, which is at the point that you make the application, you must make sure that you put in everything, everything that is of relevance, everything to give clarity to the relationship dependent the child's isolation and any emotional reports or documentation you can get you could get social services whoever in Ghana for example to give you relevant documentation to show that this child has no other relatives that they can rely on that would help the situation significantly so that you don't have too many questions from the home office because what can happen after that unfortunately is the home office could decide to refuse an applicant. Home office decide to refuse it. You then can choose to appeal. That appeal process, I guarantee you, will be no less than a further nine months. Like, this is very disturbing, actually. Yeah. This. Yeah. And, and would this be at a time when the child is living here or not yet here? No, the child has not reached the UK yet. Wow. You could, you, you, you make an interesting point there. You could, for example, have the child here as a visitor. The plus of that is you could try and get the child as a visitor. I don't know how successful it would be. Try and get the child as a visitor and then do the application from the UK. That is possible as well. You could do it the other way around. Or the child happens to be here in the UK. Unfortunately, something tragic happens back home. And then you make the application for the child to remain in the UK with you. So but they would never ways. deport a child? No. Okay, that's interesting. Um, it's a simple answer. Most of my answers have slight caveats, of course, because no is my strong answer. However, if the Home Office took the time and energy to investigate, so that should give you a clue as to whether they're going to do that, mm -hmm. um, to investigate whether the child had relatives, closer relatives that the child could rely on in their home country, who would agree to have the child, mm -hmm. then it may well be that the Home Office will say, well, they have closer relatives at home anyway, so we're going to send them back home. But we're making a range for them to be brought to home by those relatives. So it can happen. I have to say, I have never seen it happen. Imagine the trauma. Imagine oh. the difficulty in putting a child on a plane, sending them somewhere. Oh, she, they and the relatives in the UK are resistant to it. Yeah. I think that would be the most diabolical and, and the most breaking scenario to be involved in or to witness. But I, I haven't seen it. So thankfully, I, I think as far as the UK is concerned, there are provisions, there is the availability of that child to have the support that is needed for them to remain in the UK. No. When you say support, support by the parents or it, other it, outside of Tedal. Yes, but by both sides, by both, by the, if you like, the new parents, as it were, mm -hmm. or relatives, and by the authorities as well. Because, of course, at the end of the day, nobody wants that headline. Nobody wants to see that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get surprised, if I may say, when I hear of other jurisdictions, a key example is the United States, where you hear of stories of children being kept away from parents because the parents and children have emigrated illegally into the country. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as an incentive to make sure that the parents return back if you separate them from their child. Then if the parent says, look, look, I'm going to go back, I'm going to go back, give me my child. Then, of course, you give them their child and you, you, you achieve your aim of getting rid of two, three, four, five people from a family because they've emigrated or come into your country illegally. The UK tries to put the best interests of the children as a primary consideration. So you know, you, that's really heartwarming to hear. Yeah, you, you, you must have that first before you do anything else, no matter how, sometimes even in immigration, how badly or poorly the parents or our relatives have behaved. If it is in the child's best interest to remain with that family in the UK, then 
uh, uh, my view is the immigration and family authorities try to ensure that that can happen. Not always, but that's been my experience. So Linda, you mentioned something about a child like that being brought in. So you have a choice as to whether to involve social services or not. Yeah, you do, because there's nothing to stop you once you've brought the child in from just getting on with it, almost. Oh, but don't yeah. forget, they don't work in a vacuum. You have school, oh, yes. you have teachers, <laughs> and they will ask questions. Yes, mm. ask questions. thank you. And they'll want to know what's going on. How does this all work? What's this dynamic? And from my limited family experience, there are even sometimes when those authorities get involved where they're unwanted or don't need to, or it's a bit overzealous. So that's why you don't need to get social services involved. But that's why I said to you that it may well be an idea that you want to keep in mind or something that you'd want to do in order to ensure that none of the other agents come across or suggest that there is a problem in the family that perhaps there isn't. It doesn't take much with children when they need attention, unfortunately, sometimes to go and tell somebody that they may be to a parent's best interest, shouldn't tell that something's happened that hasn't or exaggerate it. And teachers naturally get very concerned if they hear something that sounds off key and want to get involved. But if you have preempted that by saying, look, this child has come over, he's my nephew, my sister's child, my sister's dad, so therefore I'm looking after him. Is there anything I need to do? Social services may just come around and say, all right, we'll just look at the house, see if everything's fine, and then go away again because they've got no involvement. That child is not adopted by you. You see, that's because I'm thinking about this and I'm, what's coming into my head is private fostering. Judith, is that coming mm -hmm. into your head? Does it come under that umbrella because that's how private fostering has kind of evolved in many ways am i right or wrong linda or have i got my definitions all mixed up here i don't know i mean when you say private fostering just explain the private fostering are the you know in the 60s in this country you had a lot of african countries mm. particularly nigerians who put their children into all those private fostering homes in you know in kent Ghanaians did it as well and they left their children there and some of them didn't do very well and some of them came and whipped their children out took them to their foreign lands without even uh, saying goodbye. So the kids got so used to that family, they saw them as their family. And there was a lot of complication, but because it was never regulated and it was never registered, very much like what you're saying, it became very messy later mm. on down the line. Mm. Judith, do you remember that whole private fostering thing? Yes, uh, yeah, it, it's something that can be a challenge. I think, you know, we have private foster carers here in Canada, for example, but they have to be registered. Like they go through an agency. So you have them either through the equivalent here is Children's Aid Society. That's the equivalent of like the local authority. But then if you're not going through the local authority of the foster parent, we have agencies that are private that you have to be assessed, you have to be, you know, vetted to do it. So it's 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 quite different in that sense. I mean, somebody can make a personal arrangement if they know somebody, but in order to have private foster cares here, it does mean they go through that whole process. And I know when we, we heard from a gentleman who was explaining this process that happened largely in the 60s and 70s to us, it was very concerning because the families weren't weren't vetted, just private arrangements were made. So I guess it's trying to link that to see in this case with the family members, if social service, because you don't want social services involved if you don't need no, to. You don't need to, yeah. That's, exactly. that's so important, I think, yeah. also to see. Yeah. And it's not to say, because I've worked there, I've worked at local authority, they also need to be involved when they need to be involved, right? So I, that's when you have the duty to report that teachers have, right? Um, and other professionals, medical professionals, social workers, obviously, if they do see a child who has harm being caused to them, because let's be honest, there is the other side of this, that again, we don't often hear about that you may bring a family member over, but maybe they're not treated as well as the other children in the home, for example, or they're essentially being treated as, as a servant for the family or, or whatnot, or they're being abused or harmed. So I guess there's that flip side of it that because of this private arrangement, not involving certain agencies could be problematic if a child was experiencing harm. So by having dialogue and open communication, you're saying, Linda, is that's the best way to sort of circumvent that from yeah. being problematic, essentially. But just that mindfulness that yeah. there are cases where people don't, you know, live up mm. to what they intend to do as well. So really, from what Judith is saying, it sounds to me like when you come into that a kind of an arrangement, as long as everything is in, you're bringing up the child very well, the child is settled and everything, you can just carry on as you are as a family, yes. Yes. basically. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, there's no requirement, for example, that you've got to, to regulate it in any that. kind of way. No, no, it's it's only monitored, I suppose, at the point where the immigration authorities are involved. They don't necessarily come at it from a social service, of course, aspect. They come of it from a migrant in order to, to check whether genuinely this is a child of your family. Genuinely, there are no, there's nobody else who is able to look after this child. Genuinely, you have sufficient accommodation. Genuinely, you have sufficient financial resources in order to support that child. Those are the main headers that the immigration authorities are concerned with. They don't come at it from the assumption that you are going to harm that child or mistreat or abuse. But then that would be the same for any. So even your own child, let's even take your own child, for example. If one parent is in the UK, the other parent is in Ghana and you're bringing your child over, nobody's going to assess to see whether you're a fit and proper parent, even if you only saw that child when the last time you saw them were three months old. No one checks to make sure that are you able to cope with and do you have the skills of being a parent when there may be a suggestion that actually you've not really had that much engagement with the child directly over the years. So it, it, it's not just the adoptive parents or adopters or the de facto adoptee. You've got the actual parents as well. There's so many different levels of different types of people who, in theory, you'd think, well, do they need assessing? Should we assess them? But aren't necessarily assessed because the immigration authorities have a tick box list, as it were, and they'll want to make sure that you fulfill that list. Once you fulfill that list, and that's it. The rest is down to you. So once you fulfill that list as well, how, how do you then escalate the situation to settle the child in this country through a residence permit and citizenship and all of that? What's the process for that one? Yeah, um, if we're talking about the, the last the examples I've just given, so in terms yeah. of mm -hmm. you bringing a child who's just your relative, a younger yeah, exactly. relative to the UK, if you are British or you have indefinite leave to remain, the child is given indefinite leave to enter. So the child is given the right to enter, full stop. There's no end date, there's no cap date on it. So the child is given leave at the shortest leave that you have. So if it's husband and wife, and let's say, for example, husband is not the relative of the child, but wife is, and wife is British. Child's not made British automatically. That's a different discussion. But the child is given indefinite leave to enter. So can stay for as long as. And, and then up in for five years, then the child can then apply for British citizenship. Five years. Yes. Right. Citizens. Yes. When we spoke the other day, we were talking about a different scenario where a child would become British. There is, under the adoption provisions, the Hague Convention. So, in 20, a nice new list of countries where adoptions would be automatically recognised was drawn up. And with Ghana, you have to have a Hague Convention adoption, so it has to be all signed off and everything under the convention, before you can then bring that child to the UK and the way you would do it is you would then register them with the general registers office in the UK and then through the general registers office after that you would apply for their British passport and you would apply for their British passport either as a matter of rights depending on what type of adoption certificate you've got from Ghana originally or you would then apply to register them as a British citizen so it's different methods but same end result so either automatic you know the British passport form just in the form send that mm -hmm. off get the passport or registration first and then a passport so slightly different steps but the same same end result and so it depends on your status really what you're saying depends on your status and this for that type of adoption, yeah for that type of adoption and then for the child to be made british would also depend on whether of course you are british were british at the time of the adoption i see at the time so it was a situation where you adopted a child way back some time ago and you're bringing and the child in later british. on yeah. yeah, and then you wouldn't, the child would not be entitled to British citizen automatically. You would still then have to go through the immigration process that I'd mentioned earlier of bringing in a child under an adopted family. And then once the child has been here, then apply for their British passport for them years later. So all of it depends on how you started the process, what documentation you've got, what the documents actually say, and whether that means it's automatic adoption, whether you have to register, whether the child then is entitled to British citizenship as of right, because you already had citizenship at the time of the adoption, or whether you then have to register them 
or whether you then have to instead just simply bring them into the UK and after five years then apply for their citizenship. So there are so many angles. And I think that's why you found it interesting. We had a discussion the other day because yeah. it's like there's so many branches and so many, if not this, then that. And if not that, then this. So it's complicated. I would never advise anybody to do it themselves. The ones that I've been dealing with recently have been very, very difficult where people have understood this law one way, but when they have applied for passport for the child and all of that or registration as a british citizen they have been told no this is a wrong form no that's the wrong way no the adoption order did not have xyz written on it so you need to use another route in order to get the child british citizen after five years of them being in the uk so there's a lot <laughs> and i don't think as time has gone on it's gotten easier i actually think it's getting more complex wow. well i wanted to connect this because what we found in North America, I would say predominantly in the States, are adult adopted people who at the time of their adoption did not get what you're talking about, their citizenship or their indefinite leave to remain. Obviously, different countries use different language, but we yeah. use the UK language for today. So I, when I heard you say that sometimes they have to have that waiting period of time, the concern is that obviously in cases where this has happened, for whatever reason, parents haven't always done that leaving their child then without the country and when they become an adult and there are cases multiple cases and times that this has happened where adopted people are actually sent back to their home country as yeah. adults and obviously they've been adopted for a reason but they don't have links to the country they usually don't speak the language you know they're being literally returned to figure out their life now that they've lived you know the majority of their life so, and there's a lot of advocacy going on around that and on getting citizenship rights for these folks. But I'm wondering, I guess, with that waiting period, has that been your experience at all? Have you have you seen that with people being, like when they become 18, 19, 20, being sent home with those documents have not been obtained? That's a real concern. I've not seen it per se, but that's because we've got other provisions under immigration law. Okay. That I know, for example, they don't have in America. Yes. We have half-life provision. So we have, if a child has spent up to the age of 25, half of their life in the United Kingdom, they can get the right to stay, leave to remain, oh. green card. Okay. Um, if a person has lived in the United Kingdom illegally for 20 years, they get the right to stay. Regardless of whether you have mother, father, brother, sister, husband, wife, children, you could just be on your own you would still be entitled to it, um, leave to remain. It wouldn't be indefinite straight away in that case. You would get a period of permission and then you'd have to renew and renew. But the point is, is that you could stay. So the opportunity to be put in that difficult position that you're talking about, where perhaps parents haven't completed the correct documentation at the time or haven't been aware that there are certain steps they need to take to regularise children's stay where they've been adopted, that I would think is certainly not something I've come across, but I would think is something that is extremely rare because we have so many other ifs, buts, what ifs in the UK that cover children, especially if they're left in a vulnerable state. I think the only thing that does come to mind, but it may be slightly off topic, is to do with the Windrush generation, which Sally... I was going to ask you about that, that one, because I've heard of cases like this where in the ring, some of them were sent back, even though they've lived virtually all their lives in this country. So but how is it that that law didn't protect them? Because they didn't have the evidence to show that they'd been here all that time. It's as simple as that. They may not have had the evidence. They may have scant evidence. I do have clients who have a stamp showing they arrived, a couple of mates saying they've been here all this time and nothing else. So what because, kind of thing should you have shown? An address trail? Well, yeah. A work trail? The, the best starting point would be a stamp in a passport that shows your date of entry. Yeah. And the rest of that passport being devoid of any other stamp showing that you left and then re-entered. So a nice blank passport would be great or evidence from the Home Office, which you can get, to show that they recognise this is the date you entered and they don't have anything to say you left after that. And so will they be asking, and I suppose one of the things they'd want you to know is what have you been doing in all that time? Yes, of course. You'd be surprised the number of us who are illegal who stay in our own community. And stay under the radar and nobody... And work and are able to make a life for themselves, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, speak their own language, stay in their own community, do odd jobs, work in a little takeaway or a restaurant, 
washing dishes or cleaning floors are um, taken advantage of, of course, sometimes during the because they they can't fend and protect themselves in way in the way in which they would if they were legal, but nonetheless manage to stay under the radar. And certainly in few cases that I've done recently, the one thing that a lot of them have interestingly been able to produce is photographs. Produce uh, photographs. Yeah, photographs. Oh, over the period. Photographs over the period. I had an interesting chap who had a photograph of himself outside the then newly built Arsenal football ground. And oh, the Home Office refused yeah. it, but the judge looked at it and went, oh, I know that building. That was built in 2000 or whatever it was. So the judge immediately recognised, oh, well, that can't have been taken before that date or after it or whatever, because this is what was happening in London at that time. Wow. So little things like that. So even where you have adopted children who haven't done, whose parents haven't done what they need to do, et cetera, there are all sorts of ways in which you can prove that, look, I have been here all that time, this time, and therefore I'm entitled to indefinitely to remain green card or a passport or whatever it is that you're seeking at the time. So it, it all is not lost. But I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing is there is a huge disparity between countries and a yeah. huge disparity between Western countries where you sort of assume where it's all sort of similar, but I find that there are significant differences in what some will allow and what some won't. Just like what, what you're talking oh, about absolutely. and what Judith is talking about, the difference is extraordinary. The Americans will send the child off at the age of having lived there all their lives and adopt a child. I mean, to be thrown into your country, I mean, if it happened to you, Judith, to be thrown into Haiti where... You know, you don't know anybody there. You actually mm. don't have any relatives there at all. And to be through, that is the most cruel thing to do to any human being. And that's what they would do in America, is it? In, in Canada. Yes, it happened a lot. And it's happened to the point where, sadly, people have died by suicide because it's just all too much. Because they can't they can't manage. They they wow. really can't manage. So that's why you have sort of the advocacy happening. Um, there's been a big uptake of that. And having, you know, adoptee rights. And I think that's the, the the really important that, you know, a lot of adopted people lose certain rights or they don't have certain rights. So having people advocate on that behalf is is key because this is literally people's lives we're talking about. And I often feel like that that gets lost, you know. So I'm really happy actually, Linda. Thank you for sharing that and you know, the difference and the fact that the UK does have these caveats. It just it just makes common sense. If you've lived here for so long, half your life or more, that you would just be given it automatically. So the fact that other countries don't have that is very disturbing. And, you know, it's a, essentially a simple solution I would offer, right? Would, so would, uh, Jude, I need to ask you this, though. Uh, would, would that mean that the parents were derelict in securing the child status in the country that they were living in when they adopted the child? Is that what it is? Or they adopted the child under the radar? What, what, what's that? What was happening there? I think that the reality is some step was missed, whether or not they didn't have the right lawyer or representation. I, I don't know for certain, but I think that something was definitely missed. It, it's hard to grasp how you wouldn't secure that for your child, yeah. you know? And there is, of course, the other dark side, if you will, of adoption, where there is, you know, what we call or what's referred to as black market adoption, right? Under the radar, stolen children, et cetera. That happens. That still happens to this day. And that's why there have been countries that have closed adoption, closed their doors to adoption because of the amount of corruption, right? So over the past few years, we've seen certain countries close their doors because they're trying to clean clean up or clean house right because it's become so rife so that's that's important to note and i think again we we often hear about this lovely sparkly side of adoption and there's a there's a whole other side to it that is often left un, undiscussed but that affects so many people as well so. you know judith what you're saying also brings to mind the fact that even here in england even though you do have all the what ifs and so on and so forth that people should be mindful of the fact that when that child comes into this country, one of the most foremost things they should be doing is securing the child's status ultimately. Mm -hmm. So the child at least has some kind of a status. They don't find themselves a no man's land kind of scenario yeah. like you're talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. that should be priority. Oh, it has to yeah. be prioritized, yeah. Wow. Right. You've explained certain things. So you've opened doors that Judith and I are both fascinated about because we didn't know about these things. Mm -hmm. And it's so useful to know this kind of information. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else you can share with us that we need to learn about as well to help us broaden our understanding more 
on this issue. We see the nice and rosy side of it when we win cases and bring families back together. And I think it's all wonderful and lovely. What, what does concern me is actually, and I think you've given me food, food for thought, is oh yeah, why don't social services get involved more? Why are they not more engaged in what's happening in these families where mm. children are brought over, perhaps not as the child of the family, perhaps as the brother, the sister of the family, and social services don't get involved. Why does nobody care enough or try to support families enough? But I'll give you a positive story that I had a few years ago. A young lady had come to the UK as a minor. So she had come to the UK by herself, I don't know, trafficked, etc., to the UK when she was 16. She managed to get herself together, get herself out of whatever scenario she was in at the time. It wasn't family, it was other people. And her family had been involved in war, either in Liberia, this is a long time ago, either it was Liberia or Sierra Leone, one of those West African countries where unfortunately there was war going on at the time. And she managed to, to very, very young lady, very brave, managed to find out through the Red Cross that her brother was then stuck in either Ghana or Nigeria um, through Red Cross. So then starts the process of what are we doing with this young man? Now, one would have thought that international organisations would try and get involved, try and help, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what happened. All I know is that she ended up bringing the case to my brother, who was a solicitor at the time. He applied for her brother to come over to the UK and it was refused by the Home Office. On the base, I think because she didn't have either maintenance or accommodation, there was something she didn't have, but she was a young person. She was just starting out her life herself. So it was quite challenging for her. And I remember when I got to court and I sort of sat there going, I don't know, right, how are we going to manage this? What angle are we going to use? I don't know. Da, 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 da. Spoke to her, felt incredibly sad about what happened. And what was so interesting is that when we went into court, we had realised that her, the wrong form had technically, technically been filled out to bring this young child over to the UK. But then I and the judge sat down and decided, well, yes, the wrong form's been used, but that wasn't the intention. The intention was to bring use the right form. And these days in the UK, we hear a lot about the Human Rights Act, which they're trying to get rid of in some quarters, or the government would like us to forget about the Human Rights Act in certain aspects. But honestly, between myself and the judge, sat down, thought, right, under human rights law, let's put aside the rules and the form and all of that. Under human rights law, what's the right thing to do? And this young boy had been taken in by an older gentleman who was fine, but had just sort of taken him in and was looking after him, etc. And the judge just said, this is her brother. We've got the evidence, this is her brother. We've got the evidence that he wants to be with his sister. And so you remember I mentioned before that a relative who could bring another relative over without having to go through an adoption and all of that. The child was still a minor. <laughs> this young lady was now an adult. And the judge and I just looked at it and just judges went, Do you know, I'm going to use the immigration rules, but use a human rights argument under the immigration rules or law. I'm going to allow this appeal. Much to the Home Office's irritation, I have to say, you sat there thinking, what the hell are you two doing? You're just making it up as you go along. But I think that at times, um, and we all bash our country, we all bash where we live and the people around us and all sorts of things. But sometimes you do get that glimmer where somebody just says, no, let's put the rules there. We yeah, can't yeah. look at the human let's being. Yeah. Let's see how these rules can work for this family and for this life. And then this young lady who by then now had um, met somebody, she was getting married, she was pregnant. So her life was moving on in a way that was amazing, given where she had come from. And she was, she was going to go to college because this took a few years to sort out. Yeah. Suddenly had her little brother by her side. They had lost their parent and they had lost another sibling due to the war and the instability. So to be able to unite them without having to worry about what is right under the law and what's not right under the law sometimes is what makes it worth it. So the one thing I can say to people that, that certainly sticks in my mind, having done that case, I think probably it's about 16 years ago now, so long ago, but it stays in my mind, the yeah. stays in my mind because it was such, it was a moment of glory to realise that humanity is not lost. Triumph. Yeah. And that we all do the right thing if only we're shown the right way. And, and I also, think that whoever has those scenarios, whoever has that situation, that difficult, that problem, and then up there is a believe in solutions. I believe yes. every scenario has a solution. Linda, this is so reassuring. You know, I, I'm almost moved to tears, to be honest with you, because 
what you're saying tells me it kind of reassures us about our faith in humanity that you know when you hear about judges you think about draconian measures and strict mm -hmm. and cutting separating families and, and when you hear that there is actually a judge who will look at a case from a humane point of view and say look how can we make this work because this is the right thing to do i have to try to stop myself from crying because it's so moving i'm so grateful that you shared that with us thank you yeah not a problem but what like i said for me my main thing to people would be get advice get yeah. right advice it doesn't matter ask questions i always say to my clients ask ask, ask me away sit here for an hour ask yeah. i want to make sure we get it right yeah. yeah. Yes. And I want to make sure we reach the right solution. If I can't help it, and many lawyers are like this. I know people get a bit worried and intimidated and afraid, but you're paying for a service most of the time. So mm -hmm. you don't have to be combative, but you can be clear. You can be firm. Don't be afraid. Don't shy away. Ask the questions. It may be something's come up that, that changes the facts, that changes the details that we didn't realise and may actually change the way in which we as lawyers, us as professionals, other professionals who work in various industries, so social workers, whoever else it may be, may say, oh, you didn't tell me that. Right, well, hang on, that changes everything. Yeah. We can do this, we can do that, and we can do that. Or let's drop A and B. Let's just focus on C. All is not lost, yeah? When, whether you're adopting because you don't have children, you want to have more children in your family, whether that you're trying to get relatives over who you want to you love and support, whichever one it is, all is not lost. Please, 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 everybody who is interested in this type of work, do come together, do support each other, do help, and do share this information, which is why this programs like this are really, really important. Because yeah. they to shed the light on what is, like has been said at the beginning of this program, a dark area yeah. so I for this program. I really, really do. Thank you. And also the fact that all of this, nobody would know about it until we have a program like this that makes it possible for people to hear it. And Linda, what is coming to my mind is you are such a minefield of information, both as a lawyer, barrister, and also from the point of humanity. You know, I'm sure there are a lot of our audience who would like to get in touch with you. Would, would it be okay for us to share your details with people who would contact you for, for support? Because I realize that this is an area that a lot of people are going to be needing help in. Yes, yeah, yeah. I certainly get queries quite often about this when people realise that there are all these angles that they haven't thought about. But I'm more than happy, ladies, for you to share my details with people. If we can get it right, that is what will make the rest of us much, much happier. Absolutely. If we should be together, can be together. I think we'd, the world would just be a better place. Much better oh. place, absolutely. Mm. So I'll just ask if anybody has any questions. Maxine, you're there and I want to find out from you in particular because you work in adoption and how do you relate to what you heard today, Maxine? Would a de facto adoption have an expiration date? Would it be good to obtain citizenship or right to remain for that child who has moved to stay in the UK? So if the child comes into this country, first of all, the de facto <laughs> adoption, does it have an yeah. end date? That's one. Secondly, yeah. is it something that you can actually help the child then to get a status, a stay in this country. Thank you. Okay, so let's deal with the de facto adoption first. De facto adoptions are for children under the age of 18. Okay, so when you say, does it have an ex date? I presume what Maxine means is that, is there a time when there is no more a de facto adoption? But mm -hmm. what I understand by that is, as I said, the child is under the age of 18. Um, and as long as they are under the age of 18 at the time that you make an application to bring the child under the de facto adoption process, then that's fine. The de facto adoption is that you live with the child in their country for a year minimum before then making an application under the immigration rules to the Home Office to say this is a child of my family, effectively. It's not your actual child because you wouldn't need to do the adoption. But this is a person that we treat as a child in our family and therefore we want to bring that child to the united kingdom as long as that application is made to the home office before the child reaches the age of 18 then that's fine does it have an expiry date i think the other way of looking at it is whether maxine's asking me does it have an end date yes and i think it's also because it's saying that 
obviously when the child comes in, they will be adopted, wouldn't they? Will they have an official... They... Not an official adoption. That's the whole point of the de facto. So yeah. it's almost like an imitation adoption. So it's not a real adoption. Okay, there is a certificate no. to go with it. No. I see. So it's only adoption in name. Yes, precisely. I see. So... Precisely. Yeah. So there isn't an end date because it's not adoption that's a formal adoption. And I think once the child comes into the country, what they need to do is start regularising their stay in the UK. Because even through the de facto adoption, the child can come into the United Kingdom and get indefinite leave to remain. So that sort of bleeds into the second question of whether the child, you then obtain citizenship or right to remain. You would have to apply for indefinite leave or limited leave to enter for the child first. So as you're making the application to bring this child in under the de facto adoption provisions, you'll be applying either for residence for the child, so leave to remain, for a certain period of time, depending on your status, or you'll be applying for indefinite leave to remain for the child if you are either British or you have indefinite leave to remain. You cannot get citizen for a child automatic under the de facto adoption provisions. You have to bring the child in under the de facto adoption and then the child would have to stay in the United Kingdom with indefinitely for five years before they would then be entitled to British citizenship. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, Maxine, does that answer the question? Oh, yes. She said thank you. That's, that's very good. Thank okay. you for clarifying that. That's a completely new one on me. Yeah, it's been around for well, it's certainly been around for as long as I've been in practice, which is long enough. Yeah. But like I said, I think it's just something people don't they're not aware of. Yeah, people aren't aware of it, and it's I think a lot of social rare. workers are not yeah. even aware of it. That, that's it's the other thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's very, very rare. Because um, as I said that last time, the, there's the two unusual ones, aren't there? There's a de facto adoption, or there's just bringing the relative into the country. As long as they're under 18, you can bring a family member over. As long as you can, as I said, prove that they don't have anyone else who is there to look after them or support them or care for them. All right. That's brilliant. So, um, thank you, Linda. Does anybody else have any questions? Max oh, Maxine, what did okay, you think of that you. one? I mean, I didn't know anything about it. Did, did you know anything about this at all, Maxine, as a social I, I... worker? As a social, I found it really fascinating because we're having to deal with immigration law, well, not directly, quite a lot of complex uh, situations quite regularly. And uh, I just wondered if it's possible to ask one more question. Please go ahead. Yeah. And this is for Linda. I'm just going to give you a scenario that I'm faced with quite regularly in my <laughs> role. One of the things I have to do, I was thinking about the other day was in the UK, if you have residence here you can adopt you don't need to be a british citizen to adopt in this country so i've got a current scenario and i just wondered whether i need to take action it could be that i don't need to do anything and it's all good i've got a situation where we've got two i'll say eu originally eu, EU residents that have got settled status here and they're looking to they've had a little child place with them and she's not originally a parent from another eu Country. So my understanding is that children, officially, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, Linda, officially acquire the citizenship of their parents. Given that that child was not a British-born child, but was born here, but obviously you don't acquire citizenship by birth in this country, do the parents, to this prospective adoptive parents, need to acquire some kind of leave to remain for that child for when they grow and grow up? I'm just worried about, you know, they get to 18. And they haven't officially, they've acquired the citizenship, their citizenship of their parents. But do they do apply separately for their leave to, to remain in this country? I don't okay. know if that makes sense. It may be me. <laughs> There's little yeah. gaps I can see in what you're saying. So yeah. may I just ask, can we do a sort of hypothetical? I think that will help my, my brain anyway. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Let's say the adoptor, so the parents are adopting, let's say they're French. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they come and they've got settled status, you say? Yes. They've got pre settled or settled status? Settled. The other term for settled is indefinitely. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. they've got indefinite. And they've got a child who's living with them. So the child is here in the UK. Is that right? Yeah. And that yeah. child. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Yes. So what you're saying is, what status does that child have in terms of immigration status? Yes. Yes. What yes. status do they have? Do they have settled status as well or pre -settled? No, basically, I'll give you this scenario. What happened? Birth mother came here from Spain, we'll say, mm. <laughs> had the baby and has gone back to Spain mm -hmm. and basically didn't want to have the baby in Spain, yeah. didn't want and left 
the baby here to be adopted. She gave permission for the child to be adopted, you know, Oh, by the, okay. you know, sign. Yeah, so she gave permission. So what I'm thinking of, does that child, it just feels, I don't know what, what nationality does the child The child is acquire? still Spanish. Spanish. Still Spanish, okay. Big, yeah, because the settled parents, the French parents, are Yeah. French. They're not British. Right. No. Um, if they're British at the time of the adoption, then the child acquires British or can acquire British citizen. But Right. if the adopted parents, as you say, have settled status only, then no. Then the child wouldn't just acquire British citizenship just because the child was born here. Do you see what I mean? Because you're right about children not automatically being British since the 1980 British Nationality Act. So following on from that, anyone born in the UK has to either have a parent who's British or... There are situations where I think a child born in the UK that's been abandoned and has no citizenship because you cannot identify the parents, that child is British because the child is born on British soil. Right? In this case, as you say, you know where the birth parent is from. So the child has the citizenship of the birth parent. And so in a case like that, Linda, does that mean that when the French couple adopt the Spanish little baby, the child then can get a settled status at least because that's what her, the new parents have? I think Maxine's saying the child has settled status already. No, no, She doesn't no. have any. The child has nothing. No, There's no nothing. status. Oh, I Yeah, see. Okay, yeah. well, then, right, so, yeah, then the child would get settled status or pre-settled status. I don't, I don't know. I think I need to know more. So the child either get pre-settled status or settled status because also the child can also acquire pre-settled status by themselves. Right, It okay. doesn't, it doesn't necessarily depend on the parents, depending on how the situation is. But in some circumstances, children can get settled status by themselves. In others that get pre-settled status, it depends on the parents and sometimes on them and how old they are as well. Right, okay. In order to avoid the situation that happens in America, the parents, obviously, I think, Linda, it sounds to me like the parents, these parents, the French parents, would need to be advised about that, to take Thank steps you. towards at least starting the journey of regularizing this child's status. And the reason is because when the child goes to school, the school will be doing excursions to other countries, and the child would need to have some kind of state to get a paper to travel with. Yeah, that's if they want to go. I mean, some parents would just say, I can't afford it. So if you can't afford your children to go on school trips, I think they don't go on the school trips. But I think it's more to do with regularising the child's status so that everybody in the family is certain about their position. Absolutely. So that the adopters know that this is the child of our family and therefore we do X, Y, Z together. And if the parents, for example, want to go on holiday, they may want to go to France. They may want to take the child to France. Exactly. and see their country or go to Spain and get the child in contact with his or her roots, you know, all sorts of things, or just go somewhere else like Denmark, I don't know. So in those situations, I, I think, yeah, definitely you'd need to regularise the child's states, which you would only do once you've done the ad
there is an issue and assume social services is resolved. Yeah. Meanwhile, social services may not address that because that's not their primary concern. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Happen. Maybe yeah. I think with some of the cases that I've done, because if I'm involved, it means we're, we're on looking that at that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. then, Linda, we also have to remember that these are local authorities that are not London based. And most local authorities that are not London based are not au fait with all these issues with immigration and all these other things. They tend to be more prominent here in London because there are more yeah. activities in that kind of area. You know, That's so, true. Maxine, it seems to me like a conversation needs to be had with you and Linda after the show to look at how. Perhaps Linda can educate your organization about this particular area. Mm. I've been educated by, I have to tell you, it's an area I had absolutely no idea about. I would never even have thought about it. And I'm mm. glad that you, you've actually confirmed it because Judith didn't know. She's a social worker. She's a social worker here. You're a social worker here as well. And this is something we all need to know. Yeah. 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 It would certainly help, I think, with some of the work of social workers who I think are overwork if there's one aspect that they knew straight away boom 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 this a a b c and then they wouldn't need to worry about that and get on with the primary work of social work is actually and also the fact that it's soluble it's a situation that can be rectified but if you don't know that you think it's a big minefield but then if you have a lawyer like linda who knows it they'll come mm. in do whatever needs to be done advise them and it's done and life goes on and there's no complication at all yeah yeah absolutely linda, it's amazing. I mean, we live and learn, don't we? I mean, Maxine, don't we just? I mean, considering that you are a manager in social work and you're learning this for the first time. I'm, I am. I'm learning lots. Yeah, it's incredible. But thank you, Linda. It's been amazing. Let me find out. Do you have any more questions, Maxine? No, no, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was a, my key question, really. Thank oh. you. Yeah. And that's a question I would have asked as well if I was on a panel and that situation came up. Amazing. Yeah. So is there anybody else who has any questions to ask? You don't. Okay. Well, look, I just can't say thank you enough to you, uh, Linda. It's been invaluable. I've learned a lot. And if Maxine also has learned a lot, that means that I'm not wrong. And Judith has also learned a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. And I'm hoping that we can bring you back again so that we can talk some more about other aspects of the law, you know. Absolutely. Maxine, yeah, yeah. So, that, so Maxine, if you have any issues that you think we could be looking at, do let me know and we can bring Linda back and we have a discussion on that one. What a beautiful note to end on. Linda, we cannot thank you enough. We will definitely include your contacts in our show notes so folks can get in touch with you if they have further questions, book a consultation, etc. We just want to thank you for sharing and shedding light because as Auntie Celia said, my, our eyes have been opened. We've learned a lot and we really appreciate and value your time. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And we just want to remind everybody that if you do have questions in this area, don't don't go it alone. <laughs> get the support, get the advice that you need so that you can keep your family connected and together. So please heed those words. But thank you everybody for watching and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode. And thank you, Linda, for coming. It's been such a pleasure having you as a guest. Thank you. Thank you so much. To all adopted people around the world, I dedicate this song, oh, Desiderata, by Les Crane. And remember what peace it's a powerful, life-changing poem for hard times, which inspires hope for all who hear it. My message to all adoptees is summed up in the chorus. You are a child of the universe. No less than the trees and stars, you have a right to be here. And whether or not it's clear to you, no doubt, the universe is unfolding as it should. And you have a unique and very important part to play in it. So stay strong, positive and focused, and you will thrive. I want to thank you all for joining us at Adoption Dialogue. If you have any questions or comments, send it to us at adoptiondialogue at gmail.com or drop it in the comments section of our social media platforms with the handle Adoption Dialogue without the UE at the end of Dialogue. Thank you again. Stay tuned for our next episode on social media. Bye for now and stay blessed. <laughs>